The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. One heck of a start today. We just had, uh, we just watched uh, about 15, actually 20 minutes of the Paul Maurice press conference. Uh, the news broke that he was resigning minutes before we were due to record, so we figured we'd wait around and watch it. And I broke um, the news to you in your kitchen, and you were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't know. And, and, and I half expected Steve to show me a tweet. It's like, oh, Steve, that's like, you know, that's Mr. Booth getting you again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Rumor break. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Smart <laughs> insider man. That's <laughs> Sim 7 on that one. <laughs> um, oh, I, I, uh, I got to tell you, um, you know, we'll go into the initial thoughts here in just a second. But if you've missed the story, if you're, you know, just driving home and you've been, you know, uh, working all day, Paul Maurice, uh, surprise resignation this morning uh, with the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, what's interesting about this is that he's had an eight-year run with this franchise. And that has to be, that's got to be the longest tenure in the NHL, right? It's up there. Like, I don't think, like, in, in the current NHL, among active. Right. There's nobody that's longer than that. None I can think of. And, you know, you think about, like, some of the longer ones. We had Quinville, Trotz, some of the other... Like, Here, you want the list? Yeah. Who's it's uh, John Cooper, oh, March 25th. We always forget about John Cooper. 2013 is when he was hired. Yeah, and then wow. second on the list, Paul Maurice, 2014, January 12th. That's there impressive. So here's the thing. You know, when you when you have a coach that's that long tenured, obviously, they're, they're you know, right at that point, they're built into the walls, right? They're part of the <laughs> furniture. And so to see that he resigned himself, and I tweeted out that it must have been serious, and people were like, wait a second, it's nothing sinister. I'm like, well, that's not what I meant. And I, I get the context of the time. We'll talk about the Kyle Beach settlement in, in a bit here. Yeah. Serious can mean a lot of things. And what I meant by that was it seemed like this wasn't, uh, uh, this wasn't just a fly-by-night flippant thing. And that became evident over the course of the press conference. Yeah, I got, I got a few texts before the press conference began, like, oh, was he allowed to resign? That's that's not what this was. No, it's not one of those. No, no. If you're looking for for that, it seemed to be, and there's going to be some significant reading between the lines here, and I think he left it open for that. Yeah. Um, what he said was he wasn't happy coming to the rink anymore. Over the course of the pandemic, his like so many people's perspective on their jobs and on their lives changed, and he said it just so for the first time in my life, it wasn't funny. He's like, it's not that I couldn't do a good job, it's not that I couldn't keep grinding, but I knew that I couldn't do the best job. And I guess these conversations have been coming, have been happening since the summertime. Uh, that's what it sounded so like. So he said he spoke with uh, Shovel Dayoff and I'm forgetting the other name. Uh, Probably Mark Chipman. Mark or? Chipman uh, and Shovel Dayoff about res- a pos- this exact situation happening over the course of the summer. And then they decided on, hey, I'm going to come back for the, the start of the season. And then now he made the decision again. So it's it's a long conversation. Like it's been months since they've been having this. He, uh, I like this tweet. I feel good. I don't have a game that I have to coach tonight, and I don't have a job to get to tomorrow. So Dave Lowry, it will, says it all. Doesn't yeah, it, it yeah. does. That's that's just all that stress just coming off yeah. of his shoulders. But so, before we talk about Dave Lowry, can I? Uh, I just wanted to say Dave Lowry is taking over as as interim yeah. head coach. That's all I wanted to say. Go ahead. Uh, Adam Lowry's father. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. that's that's pretty interesting. Former Flames captain Dave Lauer. Yes. So he gets to coach his son. That's like, kind of neat. Good like for them. Like so many dads, except in the NHL, <laughs> which I can't think of the last time that happened or mm-hmm. if it's ever happened or whatever. But that quote says it all. Yes. Like that's kind of what it boils down to in that, okay, I don't have a game to coach tonight. And you're a head, head coach of a National Hockey League team and you're relieved that you don't have to go to your job that evening. It's probably for the best that you're not doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, not a, that's not an indictment on Paul Maurice. Okay. I actually respect the hell out of the fact that a guy who's making seven figures in his job, who really, there's no reason to let Paul Maurice go. It's not like they were, he was on the edge or he was going to be fired. They had a bit of a tough start. They've had some ups and downs this season. But for the most part, Paul Maurice was going through this entire season. We should commend him for making this decision. It's, oh, it's very difficult. Extremely difficult decision. And uh, I mean, one of, one of my first reactions in talking to people was no one does this, right? No one, nobody does this. So I was dying to see the press conference to see what his, his reasons were. And, you know, when you do something unique or out of the ordinary, people raise their eyebrows and they might question your decision, but he made it anyway. And it's, it's obviously something that he wrestled with. 
because he was thinking about doing it in the summer and it's almost Christmas. So finally, finally came to it. He's also a, a unique coach um, at the National Hockey League level. He became a coach very young. I think at the beginning of his career, he was the youngest coach in NHL history. I, 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 he was barely 30, if 30 at all. I, I don't think he was even 30. He, um, I believe he played hockey and sustained an eye injury when he was young. I wow. think it was his eye. And he has coached, Adam, every single season since the year we were born. Wow. He was an assistant coach. He began his career, according to Hockey DB anyway, uh, with the uh, Windsor Spitfires in the OHL as an assistant. He became a head coach with the Detroit Junior Red Wings in 93-94 in the OHL. And every year, every single year, with the exception of the 2004-2005 lockout, Paul Maurice was a head coach somewhere. Every single year since uh, the year the Rangers won the Cup. <laughs> He's been a head coach. He began his career, I mean, I'm talking about him like he's never going to coach again or whatever. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but He probably doesn't financially need to. He probably not. But what he does need to do is is take take a minute. You, you yeah. know, I'm 33 years old. Yeah. Like, Every year since we were born. That's a long time to be doing the same thing. He began uh, coaching the first year Wayne Gretzky played for the Kings. <laughs> he uh, he began as an assistant coach with the Hartford Whalers 95-96. That season, he also became a head coach. Uh, he was there for three seasons, and then the team moved to Carolina. I was like, oh, he got fired. Nope, wait, nope, sorry, the team moved. Uh, he went to Carolina. He was there for a long time. He's got a lot of stick to it um, The or not stick to it uh, longevity. That's a skill, by the way. It is a skill, and Toronto's the only place he didn't last very long, and I can't help but feel like that was actually the Leafs' fault. Yeah. <laughs> On account of they didn't give him a goalie. No. Um, which seems to come up every episode. Funny, it came up last episode. Um, he was head coach of the Toronto Marlies for a season and was so good that he was promoted to uh, Leafs head coach. And the only year since 2005-2006 when he was with the Marlies that he wasn't in the NHL was the lockout short in 2013 year when he got to coach Metallurg Magnitogorsk, <laughs> who had my favorite line, the best line outside of the National Hockey League during the lockout when I was doing KHL highlights of Sergei Moizakin, who's the KHL's all-time leading scorer, Nikolai Kuhleman, noted Leaf, and uh, some guy you might have heard of by the name of Evgeny Malkin. Wow. I would just like to highlight... Paul Maurice's hockey DB picture because right? I have never seen Paul Maurice with a full head of hair. Oh, he was a handsome, <laughs> oh, yeah. handsome bugger. He was a handsome young man. Yeah. He's 54. <laughs> He's probably younger than all of us in that photo, including you, so? Jesse. He might be. I don't know. He might. I'd love yeah. to know where that photo's from. He's a dashing young man with that suit. Strapping, even. Strapping, yes. yes. At age 43, he became the youngest coach in NHL history to coach 1,000 games. Wow. That happened November 28th. <laughs> that happened November 28th, 2010. Uh, oh, my God. So, he's 54. You know, like, we always... I. It's funny because he's... You know, I remember reading that stat on, like, a hockey card about him being the youngest coach. And he was the youngest coach for like a, fall, a solid decade. Oh, he's still not even that old for a coach. He's no. 54. No. I, I, I always think of him as a young man, even though he's, you know, 54, 54 years young. Um, that's a long time. I get it. And, and you know, um, the thing about being a coach is you better be passionate about it because, uh, well, even watching, I remember like Babs was like going to the rink at 530 in the morning for a game that they had at seven o'clock that night. That's just Toronto, though. Is that just Toronto? Oh, yeah, he's trying to avoid the traffic. <laughs> I love that he was going in like a gigantic like Ford F-150, by the way. He next door. Yeah. 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 But, but it's, a, it's a grind to be a head coach. It's a grind. It's thankless. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you lose, it's your fault. When you win, it's not. Here, do you want one more fun Paul Maurice thing? Yeah. The last pick of the 1985 NHL draft. <sighs> I never knew that. There you go. He was and uh, that, round oh, that, That's when he was drafted. 252nd overall by the Philadelphia Flyers. I never knew that. Oh, to cool. further what Adam was saying. Sorry. Um, <laughs> which I did not do. <laughs> being, being an NHL coach, like I don't think it's so much coaching as motivating. 
And if you're yeah. not motivating yourself, like how are you supposed to motivate these players? Because they're professional athletes. Like I've said this before, they know what they're doing. If you threw out a collection of a bunch of forwards on the ice, they'd know how to play hockey and you wouldn't need a head coach. So a lot of your job is just getting these guys ready for the game. And if Paul Maurice felt he couldn't get himself ready for the game, how is he supposed to get these professional athletes ready and up for each game? That I remember that being a fun conversation with Pat Quinn in the Olympic team because people were talking about, well, there are more qualified hockey minds out there and fresher hockey minds. And I mean, he's a very good motivator and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's good enough. It's team Canada. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. All he has to do is motivate. Just them. get them fired up. It. Yeah. Yeah. And like Paul Maurice, you know, oh, I don't know about this or that. Or, no, 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 no. It's Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler. And <laughs> See, they're going to, yeah. they know what to do. Like no you're worries. going to this Olympics and oh, Crosby and McDavid are on a line. Like, you don't, what are you teaching mm. them? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I, know. I think I'll put them together. <laughs> I, I think we need to go over some tape. Yeah. yeah. Like. Um, but, you know, uh, all, that, all that said, uh, uh, so congrats to him on this next move. He feels good. He said, I feel good about not having to coach a game tonight and not having to go to a job tomorrow. Then obviously it was the right call. And you know what? I can relate to that. I can understand that. I can't tell you how much has changed about my perspective on life over the course of the pandemic, I think that's the same for everybody. If you're coming, if you're right now looking at yourself and going, I'm the exact same, then <laughs> I, I think you missed the point, right? And, and I think that there is a, a transformation happening with a lot of people where they're kind of going, am I, was I just doing this or am I happy in this? It's, uh, I've always talked about, I think the way history is taught in school is very strange, but one thing teachers would do is just talk about an entire uh, philosophical cultural shift uh, in one sentence. Yes. And then in this year, people started thinking differently. <laughs> and remember, and it's like, not why they started thinking differently. The answer on the test is what date they started thinking differently. Yeah, what it's date did everyone start thinking differently? And I'm like, why did... That's very strange it's that like everyone... When they do the, how did World War II get started? And they summarize it in like three sentences in like a paragraph. And you're like, no, this was kind of a... 20 year build and a couple wars in between. Yeah. How was this guy Hitler? <laughs> yeah. He didn't like a bunch of people. Yeah. Uh, America D Day. Like, like, that's yeah. literally history <laughs> when you're in grade 10. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Oh, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I, it drives so, me crazy the way uh, they teach but that stuff. But never did I ever imagine we would live several of those moments oh. in our life. I was about to say one, many of uh, those moments. And uh, this is one of them. And it's a moment that's lasted uh, over a year and a half now. So here's what's happening, right? Like if you're, if you're wondering why things feel a little off kilter for you. Um, and sociologists are talking about this too, is that we are in the middle of the biggest technological revolution since, um, uh, since the Industrial Revo Revolution. Like the, the way things are changing, it's, it's, it's on par. And in fact, it's more intense. We are in a complete information revolution. We have never seen information change hands this quickly. Never before have we seen this much information be available to this many people, which has its good and its bad. And our brains are still adapting. To our, bra it. our brains are adapting to this. We did not grow up like this, right? Mm -hmm. We grew up with the printed word and a newspaper, and your dad read it at the at the dinner table. Um, and then, lastly, you've got a pandemic we haven't seen in a century, uh, the likes of in a century. This is longer than the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so at, with all that in mind. Yeah, I think your perspective is going to change a little. <laughs> yeah. People might think about things differently. Do you think, like, yeah. when I look at, and, and you're going to see this in the great, uh, our, I don't want to call them best of episodes, but reaction episodes that we run after Christmas, which we've already recorded. And we, we go back and we watch some of the clips. And I go and I look at some of the stuff that we did at Rogers in the Fan 590 studio. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff we did at Bell in the backup studio. There's there. like six different studios in the videos. I don't <laughs> recognize myself. Like that person doesn't exist. The way you speak, you no. mean? Well, just like the not the way you look or anything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's my hair's a little longer now, but that's about it. No, there was there was slander about my hair. Oh, in the videos oh. And, oh, you're and I yeah, your fade. You I shan't be bent <laughs> back into shape about it. I was like, what is Steve referencing specifically yeah. about Steve's hair? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's just most of the videos were making fun of me, Jesse. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we all talked about how, like, oh, silly Jesse is. Nope. Just Steve's a big old idiot. <laughs> well, blame, blame the enough. fans of this podcast who compiled a great list of 
of clips of uh, us over the years, you know? I, they yeah. chose them. I'm yeah. fairly ridiculous. So, so all all that said, I think that was really powerful. Paul Maurice has my full respect. Good for you. Uh, Always a great press conference. Any okay. And anytime you can be self-aware enough to go, this isn't for me anymore and this is going to be hard. I mean, that's amazing. Well, and they're in the hands of Dave Lowry, who, like, I remember covering, uh, I think he was the head coach of the Calgary Hitmen when I was doing junior over a decade ago like they're they're not getting some guy who's getting thrown to the wolves here no and someone who knows no and i don't think paul maurice would have left them in the lurch like that that's why it's great that these conversations have been happening since the summer i know some somebody asked like do you regret not making this choice in the summer and he said no he didn't but i think also because he had those discussions the jets were always like okay well if this were to happen this is what we would do yep if he had just walked in and and it would have been a much harder decision for them like what do you do they obviously had a contingency plan ready to go. It was swiftly executed. He did a great press conference. And he, you know what I got to say, too? He complimented the team. He said, this team's a good team. They need a different voice. So I've been hearing about these, this company, Stance, known for their socks. They're the official casual sock of the NBA, and uh, they are the official sock of the MLB. They got both casual and uncasual with the MLB. So, I mean, good for them, right? They're moving up in the world. Here's the thing. I tried them. I love them. They're great. They're great socks. I think here's the thing about socks is that, you know, you get your boring old socks. Usually you get them at the holidays. You're like, thanks, Nan. I really appreciate that. And you do. You use your socks every day. But why can't we have good, fun, form-fitting and socks that are going to actually, you know, survive the wash? Well, here's a great thing, too. Stance also has a line of athletic apparel that you have got to check out. Um, tons and tons of great quality items. Stance's whole focus is comfort, quality, and creativity. It's about being comfortable and it's about fitting right stance believes the perfect fit matters more than fitting and that's why we want you to see for yourself so if you register an account at it, stance.com and get 15 percent off your first purchase use the promo code athletic that's it check out it's a-t-h-l-e-t-i-c use the promo code athletic stance.com enjoy the color and comfort of a life less ordinary with stance so uh, we do have some breaking news departing from uh, Paul Maurice for a second. Man, the NHL is full of breaking news at the moment. Uh, another name added to COVID protocol, and we're seeing more and more of this with the Edmonton Oilers. Oh. Ryan Nugent Hopkins is going into COVID protocol. Oh, boy. Uh, now, remember, COVID protocol doesn't necessarily mean positive. It could be we don't know. Uh, right. and, and obviously, you can, you can test your way out of it. So yeah. sometimes these, they're being overly cautious, and they should be right now. But if you want to hear some good news, also just broke. Uh, Jason Spezza had his uh, suspension reduced from six games to four games. Oh. He will play tomorrow night. So, oh, oh, wow. All right. Wow. That's good, right? I think it makes sense. I mean, listen, I don't think any of the arguments for reducing his suspension was that the, what he did wasn't bad. I don't, I don't remember us ever making that argument, but... 1,200 games played, clean sheet. Yeah. And it was a point that Elliot Friedman made on his most recent um, 32 Thoughts. He's like, first of all, the appeal process has to be better. It's terrible. <laughs> Why did it take this long? And second of all, um, you know, perhaps there should be equal treatment across the board, but if you're going to make exceptions for anybody, it should be a guy who's been in the league for over two decades and... I just got to oh, know what Gary's doing. Your like resume his time. Oh, That's so just his job. Okay. Uh, can I throw this out there? This is so far down the, the list of Gary Bettman priorities. That's and a, this terrible. needs to be something that... No, it's... Okay, there's the Board of Governor meetings. Uh, the Blackhawks just came to a settlement with Kyle Beach, which we'll talk to later. They have settlement talks with John Doe to come in December 20th, which is in uh, just a few days. COVID is rampant and the Olympics are a huge issue. This should be something that Gary Bettman should be able to delegate. I mm. think he did do that and somebody else did all of this. And then they handed Gary Bettman a, a, a folder, a, man, a manila file folder. Is that what they're called? Manila. A manila file folder yeah. on, onto his desk and said, Gary, this is your decision here. And he went, put my yeah. signature on that, and then he did it. I think that could have been done within, I don't know, 24 hours? No, I agree. No, the process is... <laughs> so... No, we agree. 
We agree. Yeah. The process is terrible. I disagree that you can agree. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. I think you're both disagreeing right now, and I'm agreeable to you guys disagree. My brain just, like, I will. Uh, you ought to. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Long well, story like, it should have been done sooner. It needs to be better. Yeah. It should have been done 100%. better. But he's going to play tomorrow. And listen, I do still think Spezza deserved four games for that. Yes. Yeah. I think four is fair. Yes. I also think what four. it does, guys, is Even it allows... six, just give us an answer. It allows for the NHL, though. This is interesting. Because he, here's the thing. Fan bases need their pound of flesh, right? What Spezza did, if, if somebody had done that to Rasmus Sandin or Timothy Lilligren or one, of, or one of the players on my team, I would have been furious. What the NHL does then is they throw the meat to the wolves, which is us, and they go, six games! And you go, fucking right! And then a week later, when you don't give a shit anymore, they go, actually, four. And you're like, <laughs> ah, I'm over it. And it's actually kind of a smart move, right? It's good PR. It, and, and believe me, that matters. That counts. Anybody watching this who doesn't think that counts, guys, that counts. They care. They do care about that. Also, as much as, as much as their process is ridiculous and stupid, it's specifically made so that they can't be held accountable. Well, which fan base would be the most mad about this news? The Jets. You know, okay, let me just slide this under the door. Let me just... Uh, also, we right. reduced it by 33%. All right, let me just... Uh, okay, bye. <laughs> I don't know. It's... Interesting timing, to say the least. Let me mm -hmm. just sneak that by you right there. Very Canadian of you there, Gary. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, to, to me, the amount of games, like the fact that it was reduced, like I don't have a passionate opinion about whether or not it should have been reduced. I do have a passionate opinion about when there is an appeal, there needs to be a quick answer. Right. There's no reason... You can't have an answer to that within 48 hours. No, there isn't. Uh, but the NHL goes, fuck you, we don't care. Also, shout okay. out Spezza for getting two game checks back. That's not, oh. that's not insignificant. You well, know, he, yeah. might be. <laughs> he, the, he lost, I think it was 20,000 over the course of six games because he, you know, he's on league min or whatever. Um, so he gets back a third of that. Still money. It's money. <laughs> you, it's like sixty six hundred bucks or something. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Not take your sixty six grand? I he can go out there and get a uh, the used car he's always wanted. <laughs> I'm happy for Jason Spetsa. Uh, I'm sure sixty six hundred dollars will go a long way. He's to probably making that based on the money he's made in his career. If you with the right financial manager, he's probably making that per month on interest on the money he has. Like think about that. Yeah, if you have the right, you don't, you you don't want right, another month. I suppose, but I don't think he's. I don't think he's losing sleep over. It. Hey, Adam, here's five dollars. Do you no, want? No, I it? want that fucking five dollars. Thank you. But I'm not Jason Spets. I'm not sitting on forty million in the in career earnings. Let's say, <laughs> let's say he's got ten million in the bank, or ten million in, in in investments. Okay, let's say he's just got ten. So we're going by the thirty oh, percent rule. What are we doing? God, okay? I'm so dialed. So into if you this got conversation. if you got uh, the right money manager who gets you between four and seven percent, Frank Zeka. That Frank Zeka. Let's say you've got ten million in the bank. That's four hundred to seven hundred grand each year. So he could be on ten million bucks making league min on top of the league min he's making. Sure. See, these are the thoughts that go through Adam's head. Here's what is going through my head. Jason Spezza could take that sixty six hundred dollars, put it into a t shirt cannon, walk into the nearest Starbucks and fire it at all the employees and say, Merry Christmas Don't do that. and walk out. Why that's not? A, that's a fire hazard. Yeah, Steve, you're a fire hazard. I think they'll risk it. <laughs> Don't do that. It's somewhat okay. You're w let me look into the camera. Like, you can fire money here. <laughs> you can fire money at me. You're allowed. This is you're allowed to fire. And what else at me. we got on the I'll show? I'll take today. the risk of you firing money. Uh, at me. well, uh, Montreal played without fans last night against Philadelphia, and I know tomorrow's game versus Boston is uh, uh being postponed. And you know, uh, I think, yeah, out of out of pure caution, right? And, and remember that you know, in, in Canada. Our view on how we're handling the pandemic is vastly different from the states. Be that as as good or as bad as you think that is, I'm not even going to offer an opinion. But what I will say is that I don't know if people know where we stand. I th I th I think <laughs> I think get a vaccine is where we stand. Um, but I think the the whole thing is um, now I'm going to be curious to see how other jurisdictions handle this. I actually I got to tell you guys a story. So. I get home yesterday and Natalie, my girlfriend's, uh, you, you know, when you get home and your partner's vibes off. Yes. You know, the vibe, right? 
Do you have a difficult time extracting that information from her? No, she's really good about it. Oh, really good about it. We both are in serious therapy. Is that great? Is that fun? I've been in serious therapy for a long, long time. She's been in serious therapy. Not serious, like not serious, like, whoa, but it's serious as in like, you you take it seriously, right? So communication actually in in this relationship is really great. But see, my new one is, do you want to do this now or later? (laughs) (laughs) Do you need a minute, right? Do you need a minute? She's. Scottish, she needs a minute. But Jesse, you know that, right? You know yeah, that yeah. Your partner's I'm, I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the story. So the story. So I walk upstairs. <laughs> what if I cut him off? And because, <laughs> like, because I'm an what, ang- first show. <laughs> like, hmm? I wonder what happened. Here? Adam has walked in the door of his house walked eight door. times now. Okay, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> Natalie. Is it? Adam's in the front door, and we haven't gotten past the front door. So, so <laughs> you you walk and you go. Something's off here. Something's not right. Right. And. Um, you can tell in the tone of someone's voice Uh-oh. and you go, and so my, because I'm an anxious boy, mm. anxious boy goes, how do I make this about me? That's what an anxious. Mm. So you instantly go, did I do something? And as my therapist likes to say, Adam, not fucking everything is about you. And he <laughs> says it. In, did, so yeah, he swears at me like that. Oh, and I need to hear that. Mine, I need the hockey coach. Mine doesn't. No, I need it. <laughs> I need it. He's like, I want to be loud and clear about this. It's not always your fault. Um, and so I instantly go to. Did I do something? Now, I already, I'm going to give you an aside story here. Um, uh, we've discovered her cat, Teddy, who's like this beautiful white cat. He's got, um, got some f- a few bites on him. And we think that the dogs may have brought home some fleas from the beach. I live next to the beach. So I got the flea collars and the whole thing, whatever. And, you know, Teddy had to go to the vet. We had to make sure it was fleas. We don't know if it was fleas. The vet doesn't know if it was fleas. I'm like, you went to school for 14 years for this. Come on. What do flea bites look like? Anyway, so she's stressed about that. And then I say, I say, I don't feel like this is the whole story, though. Mm. And that's when she swivels her chair away from her legal work oh, no. and looks at me. Oh. And the tears come. <gasps> like, like, here comes the rain again. And I go, honey, what's going on? And she said, I'm going to show you something. And I'm really upset. So <laughs> she shows me a 3D rendering of an arena. and. I realize that my, and she tells me this, is, uh, I'm realizing that this is Scotiabank Arena, and it's a 3D rendering of Scotiabank Arena. And I, I'm kind of looking at her a little bit lost, and then I realize what's going on here. So she, she and I were going to go to the Penguins game on the 29th. Oh, and, fiddlesticks. Uh, or is it 27th? 29th. And she had this whole thing planned out with Jer- New Jersey's and oh. like doing dinner at Real Sports. She had the, the thing booked. Um, and uh, in Ontario... Because of the uh, Omicron variant, um, even though the ICUs are not exploding with people at the moment, we're out of an abundance of caution. The government said half capacity, which means everybody that's not a season ticket holder had their tickets canceled. And she had worked on this, saved up, been ready for months and was so excited. And she's like, I, I haven't seen a Leaf game in person since before Everly was born. So, Yeah. So my, my daughter's two and a half. I haven't, I haven't seen a game since. Was it that shitty Tampa game that they lost? Yeah. We all went to? Yeah. That was the last game <laughs> I went to. That was the last to. one? 7-4. Oh, that sucks. I'll never forget. And so, <laughs> so anyway, long story short, she's like, I know you haven't been in a long time, and I just feel so terrible. And she's like, and then I was logging on, and I couldn't buy more tickets or whatever. And it's because if you, um, if you try to buy a ticket now, if you bought Raptors tickets, Leafs tickets, OHL is affected by this. All of them are have capacity. Obviously, Senators as well. Everybody's at half capacity now. And at the end of the day, the Christmas present aside, which I thought was really thoughtful, and I'm not bothered by it. Like, whatever, we'll go to a Leaf game eventually. It'll happen. But all of that aside, I feel like over the holidays, it's a chance for everybody to kind of reset from this. Obviously, the cases are on the climb everywhere in the entire world right now. It's big. Is there, and everybody's suggesting this, is there any merit to, to, to pausing the season? And my instant reaction is no. First of all, what's more adorable than new love? <laughs> <laughs> Natalie doesn't understand something about you that I've known for years. <laughs> Which is you don't give a shit about gifts. <laughs> it's not my love language. It's, no. no, it's not you, my love language. You don't care. Thank you for the, and you're hucking over your shoulder. <laughs> I'm going to forget it in my you office. It out of the bag. Adam, how many gifts do you have in your office oh, at work God. right now? So many. So many gifts. People... You, People in the office give Adam gifts, and they remain in his office 
for, I don't know, years? Don't yeah. bat it off the table <laughs> like a cat. I love he giving. Care. I lo- but I have what I need. Yes. So I'm very, very Spartan that way. Like, I'm, I'm actually really excited because, um, you know, we have the SDPN clothing. I'm like, why would I just go? Why would I buy any other adult clothing? Oh, I thought it was because you'll kick the gifts down a giant hole never yeah. to be seen again, <laughs> Leonidas. Yeah, <laughs> someone got me something stupid. It's a gift. This yeah. is I'll useless. Need it. <laughs> he kicks it down the hole to never be seen again. Your question uh-huh. about pausing the NHL season. Okay, so I, I was thinking about this on the way here because, again, big fan of caution. By the way, Nick Cousins said they should. Came right I out saw that it. on Twitter. Mm-hmm. First player that I know who said that. At least I, publicly. I like caution, but I also like trying. And I feel like trying, at least with continuing the NHL season, is the right thing to do. What I was thinking about, however, is the integrity of these games is being affected. It's- sure. Yeah. Or are you dealing with, to that point, and Jesse, I, I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> Is it you're playing with the circumstances you're given by life? Yeah. Yeah, but like... Okay. The integrity is being affected because they're like the salary cap guys. That's an issue for me. That is an issue, but also, why does it feel like it's almost exclusively the star players getting affected by this? Yeah. Like the, the avalanche with Kale McCarr and with Darcy Kemper. You might be like, Darcy Kemper's a star player. No, but he is the starting goaltender, which is slightly important. Um, and they, then they gave the avalanche the option of playing anyway, and like not just missing those players, but shorthanded. Yeah. They played down two guys. And then Anthony Duclair talks about the Florida Panthers were not afforded the same opportunity to, um, uh, well, it's evolving. Re- refuse to it's play evolving. Or- Those it's are evolving. the circumstances of the world and of the season. Yeah, we're like, changing on the fly here. Come yeah, on, Anthony. Last is- season, there was taxi squads. That was the circumstance. When we were in the bubble, that was the circumstance. You know, it's just that's how Part it's of playing. evolving. So the that's, other play- that's like being right like, now. well, the you know, star player is injured. We can't play the game. The, so the other question I ask myself is, could we possibly do this better? Oh, I'm and sure I don't that. know if I have an answer for that because yeah. like what? Like what do you, you tell the, everyone go home? The one thing I would say is if you do tell everyone to go home, you know what they're gonna do? People are gonna go and fuck off and get together with people anyway. Especially in America where there's no limitations. Like you can tell me, oh well, New York reinstituted its mask ban. Or like sorry, not mask ban. They like they but they brought the mask no, no, back. That's, that's Florida. Yeah, mandate, it's, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in Florida it's like you can't mask up anywhere. Um <laughs> but in, 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 in New York, yeah, you gotta wear your mask in store. Man, that never went away up here. We've always worn the masks. Right. And and so, so my thinking is, and Arashma Danny made this point. I think I brought it up in the last show, but you I want to highlight this again. Just because they're not playing the games doesn't mean they're not getting exposed to COVID. And in fact, it makes more sense to keep people, to, to restrict access to things that they can do and keep them playing. I get not having people in the arena. I get that. They're probably safer on the ice. Probably safer (laughs) if they're in the bubble environment. When somebody is your employee and under your care, I'm sure you have a lot more control of Austin Matthews when he's on the team playing games than when he's at home. Man, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you you just give give these people who have never had a minute off in their life, think of what it takes to get to the NHL, and all of a sudden you're going to be like, do whatever the fuck you want. We're pausing. Yeah. I right. think you're going to see more COVID cases. Especially in the states where they're not pausing anything and everything is just full force still. Like, it doesn't... Pausing the season, it doesn't make sense to me. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, as, a, I, okay. as a solution to solving whatever they're trying to solve, just the competitive balance or just yeah. getting the season done, pausing it in the middle, it doesn't seem like a smart solution. Yeah. Hey there, young multimillionaires. Yep. You get three weeks off. And yeah, why? All of them collectively say, you know what else starts with a C? Cancun. <laughs> and that's where I'm heading immediately. <laughs> also, do we think in three weeks the world is just a magically unpandemic? It only no. takes two weeks to flatten the curve, guys. You know that. <laughs> Hello, March 2020. Two weeks. To hey, we'll be out of the curve. studio for a couple of weeks and then we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a Steve Dangle podcast. I'm Adam Wilde, no, and I'm this, getting a divorce. <laughs> this is just going to keep going. It's going to keep chugging along, so we got to find a way to work within it. Yes. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, and yes, could it be done better? Sure, but yeah. sometimes you learn on the fly. And I'm giving, I'm giving the NHL, the players, at the Players Association, everybody get, get some grace here. The other thing that you can't do, and I was reading this in the Washington Post, and I thought it was such a salient point yesterday. You can't come at a 2021 problem 
or a 2022 problem with 2019 solutions. A lot of what, um, what we knew about the pandemic in 19 and 20, like late 19, early 20, is a lot different than what we know now. So going back to the things that we did at that time, uh, which were somewhat effective, it's not exactly like, that's not exactly the recipe for success. If it was, then we wouldn't be in this position in the first place. We would have eradicated it. We're not there yet. Everybody's got their vaccine uh, in the NHL except for Tyler Bertuzzi. And you have most players, thankfully, being almost symptom-free or mild symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. What an improvement. So now the question is, how do you keep the games going? And how do you improve testing so that somebody isn't taken off the ice in the first period? One thing that's happened in the NFL is they are allowing uh, players, if they test positive during the week, uh, they can have two negative tests within the same day. And then if they're asymptomatic, they can go back on the field. So what does that mean, though? Does that mean you can share it? Like if you've, okay, so if I have a positive test mm -hmm. and then I have two negative tests, mm -hmm. does that mean I have no COVID? They're saying if you, if you have two negative tests within the same day, you can go play if you're asymptomatic. Okay. And, and yeah. then my next question would be, if you are asymptomatic, and I guess if you're testing negative, you don't have COVID, mm -hmm. but if you... Because the thing is about, there's been a few NHL players that have said this, like, if I'm asymptomatic, why can't I just play? I, I thought the reasoning for that, and I could be wrong here, is that you, even if you're asymptomatic, you can still spread it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, if you have it. But if they're, have they're it. saying all they need is a negative test within the same day. Right. Even if you tested positive yesterday, if the next day you got two negative tests and you're asymptomatic, you can go out and play. I'm assuming that... What's the, I mean, yeah, why wouldn't you? That makes so sense to there, me. There are other solutions. My peasant brain. Plus, they have uh, a lot quicker testing because everything's in America. It's, it's a lot different circumstance. Oh my than God, what Canada. a joke here. This. So they have the very quick uh, testing now that they've implemented because they did have some complaints earlier in the season about uh, the league just not ruling on testing quickly enough. So they're changing all that. So there are solutions that the NHL can implement that other leagues are trying to do where we can get guys back on the ice quicker. Because it, there are options here. Yeah, it's, we can get it, the season done. It's also not about eradicating it because that's yeah. not happening. And that's not the NHL's job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not yeah. on the NHL to eradicate COVID. They're an entertainment <laughs> yeah. product. Yeah. <laughs> that too. People I, act <laughs> like it is, though. And I'm like, hey, right. hey, hey, hey. I'm not fans of the way this league's run either, but we can't give them, give them a break here. Yeah. That's not, that's not yeah. fair. I think the point here is just that. They can play these games, and there's there's a way to work within this. Just like how everybody's adapted at their own workplace, where you're working from home and you're doing all this other stuff, the NHL can find solutions as well. I would like to see a lane picked. Uh, the lane is we can do this. We're going to get through this, mm -hmm. or abject terror. And <laughs> I just I want a lane picked. Tell me how. Tell anyone how to feel ever. Well, I think I think what's happening is is, and and I I get to an extent why they're doing this up here, but what it can cause problems. So what's happening is abject terror before the abject terror actually happens, right? So you can spook people so that they'll chill out and then hopefully curve on this thing. The problem is that when you do that enough, people just tune you out. Yep. How many? What percentage of the people listening right now? heard the recommendations around Christmas and just went, that's nice. Oh, I would say it's pretty significant. Yeah. Whether or not, whether or not you personally agree with, you know, wherever you stand on that, I would say a significant, maybe over half of people who heard that said, uh, fuck, fuck off. <laughs> uh, or I'm going to find some way around this. One of the things that a lot of families are doing is they're doing rapid tests before you go to Christmas dinner. That's what I'm doing. Why not? Rapid. I'm, I've got a, I've got a dinner on the 24th and dinner on the 25th. Steve, rapid test before both. After, what was it? Yesterday's recording. We had a recording for something. What did, what did we talk about? Maybe it was after Wednesday's show. We talked about going to the Lickbo. You know, yeah. you go to the Lickbo, you get a thing of Bailey's and you get a rapid test because that's what Ontario has right now. Yeah. yeah so yeah. for anyone who doesn't know, in Ontario, <laughs> they're handing out. <laughs> I hate Doug Ford so much. He, we're, <laughs> we're finally giving out rapid tests. Finally. We were not. We had 20 million of them sitting in reserve and they were like, no. And the place they're doing it. Where they're handing them all out is the liquor store. <laughs> and the library. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. library. No, I didn't see the library no. anyway. Well, the <laughs> SCBOs. Who the, who the... The thing he's trying to defund constantly. 
The library. Oh, yeah. Well, Everyone head to the library. Get some Dr. Seuss books. Anyway, the reason we though is that how everyone's going to be going to the LCBO. We everyone's have, going to be going to the liquor store. We have store nationalized liquor sales, which is those are all technically government buildings, which is why they can give them out there. That's why they're doing it. And by the way, it's just provincially, hilarious. provincially, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, not across provincialized. Yeah. It provincialized. <laughs> the other um, day, he got on TV and said, "We're not comparing apples to bananas here." And I was like, "I want to kick you in the chest." Why did he <laughs> say that? I don't, I don't remember. Know. Yeah, listen, because I've tuned him out. Right, right, right. It's yeah, like all, everyone so, else. <laughs> so, long story short, this is not where we went, wanted to go yeah, with. This. We went way too far. Yeah, Steve. <laughs> what? Where we to go. Sorry, I'm a little flustered. <laughs> For my child's entire life. You're all going to die! Next day, it's fine. <laughs> so you're asking the NHL to pick a lane. That's all you want. Yes. I do. I'm asking everyone to pick a lane, please. Yeah. Let's well, pick a lane. The, lane is, the lane right now is what the lane is where, wherever you live. But regardless of that, as we're far all as driving it, into the barrier. Right as far now. as the NHL goes, I think, I think pretty much the best thing that you can do is keep the games going. Fans or no fans or half fans up to your local jurisdiction. That's none of my business. But I do think you got to keep these games going. And I think for, frankly, for mental health reasons, I got to tell you, uh, uh, I, I can relate to some of what Paul Maurice said in his press conference today oh, about yeah. this. He's like, this job wasn't fun. I'm like, fucking A. <laughs> my, my job wasn't fun either. Like, it was not fun waking up in the early morning. I remember at Virgin Radio when we did this, all the commercials went away except for Government of Canada sponsored ads or Government of Ontario sponsored ads, which are like, stay home, don't die. Stay home. Hi, this is John Tory, mayor of Toronto. Please stay the fuck home. That was literally what it was for like, and the, so we'd have three minutes of commercials back to the thing. And it was, so it's doom and gloom and shitty and you're waking up and it's cold and whatever. It was brutal. I get why he did. He says he didn't have fun. It wasn't fun. The one thing that I was excited for in 2020 and 2021 was what we're doing right here. Yeah. Hockey. Mm -hmm. So let's keep it going. Yeah. I feel closer to the sport now than I ever did before just because oh, yeah. it dragged my sorry ass through the last two years. And I was so happy for that. Easily. But even still, like even with the most fun job, there were moments doing oh. like the Wayne Gretzky trade tree where I'm like, fuck. I know. You know what sucks about having a fun job? You can't complain about it to anybody. <laughs> like, oh man, I've been working on this Gretzky trade tree. It's taken me three days. Mm -hmm. It's, oh man. And meanwhile, your, your brother-in-law who works for Pure Later and ha is having to like uh, oh, deliver all those packages. Oh my packages. God. He, do you follow him on Instagram? I do. <laughs> so every day, I give him shit every time he doesn't listen. Car. Oh man! Woo! Like it starts in like October or something, and and you're like, okay, there's more packages than there were the day before, and then by the end of it, he's stuffing them in like the Grinch. Yep. <laughs> like he, uh, it's it's nuts. And during the pandemic, <laughs> he was full. Like the the thing was like in March, it became Christmas again because everybody was ordering everything in. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, I give him shit every time he's got a different radio station on than Virgin Radio. So he'll post the, he posts the back of the truck and then he'll post what he's listening to. He loves Christmas. He music. does love Christmas music. What's he, wrong with him? He's very jovial. Like I love Christmas music too, but I also know that today's hits are what it's all about. Motherfucker. We should have switched SDPN radio to all Christmas. Can you imagine? Let's like music? It. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. I can, can get you? royalty free Christmas music. I got, oh. a whole, I got a whole library of royalty, royalty free, free Christmas yeah. music. Give me some of that. Oh, we could have done that for a whole month. Oh, <laughs> we can do it all week. You want to play Christmas music on our radio? Do you want to play it? You're the one who knows. You know what would be fun? It. Is if we, we could. Did, if could you, we do one and one? Could we do break? Like, you segment? Want to okay, so I can insert Christmas music into the rotation on SDPN Please. radio. That would be amazing. So in between some of our episodes, you'll hear like a three minute. Uh, generic Christmas song. <laughs> Dude, I'm look up hockey Christmas music. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's do it, baby. It's Let's neutral it. outside. Uh, I'll uh, um, I'll I, get on that this weekend. I want. I want. <laughs> I can't wait. By the way, I want to know what your give us your recommendations of the best royalty free Christmas music <laughs> is when you hear it on our station. By the way, for SDPN Radio, if you don't know what that is, go to the app. If you haven't downloaded the app, SDPN. Just search it in your app store. Or sdpn.ca slash radio. Yep. You can listen on your web oh, browser. Oh, that's great. Because I know some Android users have experienced some problems with um, if they listen for too long, it'll like cut off. But oh. that's only an Android problem. So uh, if you want to listen on your browser as well, it's sdpn.ca slash radio. One of many Android problems. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, uh, 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 
I, I want you to I want you to screen grab when a Christmas song comes up and and tell us what you think. Give us like a, <laughs> a five out of, out of five hockey sticks. How many hockey sticks do you give it? And then um, I also want to shout out just SDPN Radio in general because we like when Jesse created this. Steve and I were like, oh, that's so cool. But we thought maybe that's just for us. But what we I think there's been totally like twenty five thousand people have have checked it out. Oh, I started to it out recently. I yeah, that was a, like a month ago. Yeah, it's more yeah. than that. It's a lot. It's probably a lot. I can't yeah. wait. Jesse messaged me once. And he's like, "There's like a hundred people listening right now at <laughs> right once." Now. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, "You'd be lucky to get that on a Twitch stream, not you, but like anybody." Yeah, yeah, no, no not not me in my stream. Crap. No, like you know, <laughs> the, the bads, the ones who aren't good. Yeah, Jesse's good. I I cannot wait to hear this. They lost to us. Simply having a wonderful it's Christmas. Gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Oh, it's gonna be good. I don't know how we got there. It doesn't matter. Hey, okay, so a little bit more serious. And and this is wrapping a story that that you I have to tell you, there's there's some stuff that 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 went on behind the scenes with this story that will come out in, in years to come. But for now, uh we know we we at least finally know that. Kyle Beach got a settlement agreement in place with the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah. And I, I guess they they met with a mediator, uh, the Wartz family lawyers, and obviously Kyle Beach's lawyer come to an agreement. Um, obviously, the sum will remain undisclosed. Uh, and, you know, it really doesn't matter how much money it is to us. But what I hope here is that, and this is the only way that you can, you can do this, that some there's some sort of peace in... Kyle knowing that the story's out there and that there being some financial compensation for him. There's nothing that the Blackhawks can do to take this back. All they can do is be better going forward. Um, and unfortunately, Kyle's career was affected enormously by this. But it was nice. It, in all the tough news, that was great to see. It was a process that took far too long. And that's exactly what I was expecting out of the mediation process. And I believe it lasted a day. Yeah. They met one day. One day. And that's not what I was expecting at all. I, knew, I had December 15th circled on my calendar for a long time. And boom, he got a settlement. And John Doe 2 will be uh, in a few days on December 20th. A good mediator uh, solves a lot. Now, I want to say this. Um, you know, when we started talking about that story, and we had Rick Westhead on in the summer. In a barn. In a barn. When he was in a barn. Uh, uh it wasn't getting the coverage it deserved, quite frankly. Rick was out there promoting it, banging the drum, but nobody was supporting it. And I just want to say a shout out to you who listened to this show and shared it and pushed it because um, whatever small part this show played, it was because of you. You know, a lot. Well, I'll tell you what they would have said in traditional broadcast. They would have been like, "That's that's dead. Like that. No one's going to watch that. It's too depressing." They come to us for an escape. Nobody's going to watch that. I, I think at last check, over eighty thousand people consumed that episode. We had fifty five thousand on YouTube, and I think another twenty five thousand on on audio. Wow, which is unbelievable. And I just, I just want to say uh, how much we appreciate the fact that you shared that that you reacted to that, that you talked about that, and you didn't let it die. The, the, the changes that occurred within the Blackhawks and with the NHL and what will occur in the NHLPA going forward are because you stuck to that story and you got behind what Rick Westhead and Katie Strang did. And, and that's, that's the thing, right? You got to show sometimes uh, that tough subjects matter to the average person that watches the NHL. We're, I mean, maybe we're all above, we're all a little bit, like when it comes to NHL fandom, we're all a little extra. I get it. We love hockey. But what you did there shows the power of uh, what an audience can do to affect change. And we didn't have to start any petitions. Uh, we didn't do fundraisers. We didn't do anything. What we did was we shared the information, all of us, and we didn't let it die. And we let the journalists do their jobs. And Kyle Beach now at least has a little bit of closure. Is the work done? No. There's John Doe too. Yep. There's other things to have. But I just wanted to shout that out. I think it's an important spotlight. And I just want to say how special this community is. Blown away. Absolutely blown away. The people, when I talk about what we're doing here with the SDPN, uh, when I talk to Alan about it, when we talk to Chris about it, uh, Andrew, Julian, and all the people that we're talking to about bringing on, and we will be expanding next year, um, what I always say is the same, is that this is a special 
relationship and it is not like listeners and a show. It's a community of people that right. are, you, you know, they don't always agree. <laughs> We're not even always kind to each other sometimes. Nope. But what I can rely on is the fact that everybody's got great moral fiber, great values, and believes, has a strong belief in what's right and what's wrong. And, and the unity of the community on this one was huge. And thank you so much for it. Yeah, Rick Westhead, I don't want to speak for him, but he's with TSN now. He's with the Toronto Star. He was on Hockey Night in Canada. He's been in media for a very long time. Uh, but your reaction to that initial episode blew his mind. Blew his mind. And that's why he was back. And, and uh, I think uh, you really helped fan the flames here. Well, yeah. Thank you. There was a point after what initially came out in probably like May-ish, June, and then it went through the draft and the summer, and the story seemed like it was dying down. But the people kept it going. The people didn't let the NHL forget that this is the biggest deal that's going on and yep. this is so important. So and it's because of all that pressure and just people keep keep the media cycle going about Beach's story. That's what kept this story going and what enabled all of this to happen. So yeah, thank you. I don't remember the exact timeline, but I think the the spark that sort of reignited it shortly before the NHL season was um the corroboration of uh Paul Vincent Mm -hmm. uh with the formerly with the chicago blackhawks and uh i think the massachusetts police department so don't was, forget this yeah. was a story that blackhawks people knew about was coming back in december of 2020 uh, and they thought was just going to go away because they didn't alert anybody at the nhl that this lawsuit was happening yeah it was, it was gonna rick come digging through files they thought it was just gonna die and thankfully rick and katie and then Everybody who read the story and kept it going, yeah. kept the story going. And the local Blackhawks media who, who were on yes. this, they also deserve the shout-outs, too. Absolutely. Um, it was quiet in the beginning, but there were some Blackhawks reporters that were on this from the beginning, too. And so they deserve the, the credence that they were given. Thank you to Rick and to Katie and to those people. It's why journalism matters. Yeah. It's an old trope, exactly. but, it, but it does matter. It does affect change, and you affected it, and so thank you so much. And it's, it's been little smatterings, but I've noticed it's changed hockey journalism. It's changed the conversation. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me specifically what you mean? Uh, I don't... Eh, it's That one's tough. I don't want to speak for people, but I'm noticing different questions being asked, and I'm noticing different processes. Mm. People are... Um, I think hockey is because it's very specific, right? Like uh, journalism, you can, uh, or general journalism, I should say, quote unquote news journalism, you cover all different things. But with hockey, it can be very cookie cutter, very um, sy systematic. Um, and I think people are sort of realizing there's something outside of the four walls that traditional hockey journalism is built around itself. Um, I'm, really i i'm very encouraged by what the next generation of hockey journalists have to offer and the current generation is learning as well i hope the people who didn't cover it felt the pressure and know better for next time they did there it is all right let's get to the press conference hey how's your sleep been lately it's kind of an important question a lot of people ask it and you kind of shuffle off the answer like yeah oh, it's been fine it's fine good enough when it comes to your sleep, which is something you do, hopefully, six to eight hours a night, that's the recommendation, to sleep right, you got to have the right mattress. To get the right mattress, you got to get a mattress that tailors itself to the way you sleep, and that's why you should go with Helix. Listen, I got a Helix mattress, and I took the quiz. It took two minutes, and it matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? With Helix, you get a mattress that you know would be perfect for the way you sleep. And here's the other part. Sometimes... If you're lucky enough, you sleep with someone else, as in they're sleeping over. Or maybe you guys are together full time and you're always sleeping together. Well, what, what about how they sleep? Well, the Helix mattress quiz kind of matches that too, which is kind of sweet, right? So you both get the kind of sleep you're looking for. If you're looking for a mattress, take the quiz, you order the mattress, you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door. It's shipped for free. You don't have to go to the mattress store. It was awarded the number one overall best mattress in 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. And Helix has been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine. It's a go-to for sleep 
improvements. And if you just go to helixsleep.com slash STP, you take the two-minute quiz, they'll match you with the customized mattress, give you the sleep of your life, 10-year warranty. They'll even pick it up for free if you don't like it. After 100 nights, risk-free, you get to try it. Go to helixsleep.com slash STP. And we're going to offer you this, 200 bucks off all mattress orders and two free pillows. You can keep the pillows. Helixsleep.com slash STP. Check it out. How's your mental health? Listen, the best way to think about therapy is um, somebody, uh, a member of my family who's a gearhead said, you tune up your car. When was the last time you tuned up your brain? And it's kind of always stuck with me, right? I love cars. I love my brain. Who knew, right? Great one. And that's the thing. We go to the gym, we work out, we work out our bodies. Therapy is a workout for that. It's making sure that you're taking care of the health that protects your health. Your mental health, it's where it all starts and better help can help you. Here's the thing. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions for you and your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to, if you don't feel comfortable. It's also more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why would you invest in everything else but not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Go to betterhelp.com slash SDP and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-T-P. Look after you. The Presser S-D-P. The Steve Dangle Press Conference. Steve, I, I got to ask you. Oh, no. What you thought of what happened Wednesday night when... Myself and the crab people, not so much the crab people, but myself, traded John Tavares ah. for Lucas Raymond on uh, the first episode of One Since 67, our quest to win one Stanley Cup with the Toronto Maple Leafs in NHL 22. Ah, crab people. <laughs> <laughs> I love watching people learn. <laughs> in the same way that Adam's girlfriend just learned that he doesn't give a shit about gifts. You learn that Jesse doesn't give a shit about feelings. <laughs> Yo, true. <laughs> and he does not. Yeah. And, you know, part of me, uh, I love the idea. One since 67, you're trying to win a Stanley Cup in NHL 22 with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I was like, how is Jesse going to make this interesting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's me going, well, <laughs> what do you do with like Andre Kasha? All gone. Nick, Nick Ritchie and bye. Yeah, but but I wasn't thinking big enough. Mm -mm. You, Jesse, if if you were a Mortal Kombat character, you wouldn't have a punch. You wouldn't have a kick. You would just reach straight into everyone's chest and pull out their still beating <laughs> heart. People got really mad at your me. Your first was it your actual first move? It was the first trade. Your first yeah. trade was to trade the captain because I wanted to sign Bobby Ryan in free agency, and there was not enough cap space in uh, for the Leafs. This man <laughs> traded John Tavares so he could get Bobby Ryan. <laughs> no, but also so I could get Lucas Raymond and free up ten million dollars in cap space because Lucas Raymond makes under a million dollars. Yeah, there was there was great logic to it. Yeah. You're freeing up the cap space. Yeah. Um, you're getting a player who you know does well in the future because you had him on your Buffalo Sabres. He's a, he's a 79, I think, when I traded for him. But he matures into like an 89 how many, in like two years. How many trades have ever freed up $10 million in cap space? I don't know. I think the I don't think that's zero. ever happened. I, I think I'm confident also, the answer is zero. I turned Muzzin and Dermot into Nick Suzuki and uh, Romanoff. And did people freak out about that? Yes. Did they freak <laughs> out about that as much? No. No. No, no, no. Because you <laughs> pulled out their mm -hmm. still beating hearts. That's how you began. Mm -hmm. You started but that. that also led to having a great moment with Morgan Riley when we gave him the captaincy live on the stream. Wow. I can't wait. We put a crown on his head. Can't wait until uh, Jason Spezza takes the captaincy away from him when you hire him as head coach and then fire him less than a year in again. Jesse will play with your emotions and he will giggle as he does it. Okay, let me get to a question. Uh, next stream is tonight. Uh, I think we'll start at 7.30. So and who will Matthews be going for? We're in the first round of the playoffs. We snuck into the playoffs with a depleted team. It's very exciting. 
Question for Adam. This is from T. Davey. When history is told and taught, we often focus on the dark sides of humanity. Mm -hmm. War, slavery, tragedy. Yes. Why do you think that is? And do you have any happy slash fun history stories? Oh, I'm sure I do. This I think... also received two Adam Wilde emoji thumbs up. Just two. <laughs> Just two. <laughs> Which is a thing you can do on our Discord. Um, okay, so the reason that we do that is because when tragic events happen, they're so out of the context of what we're used to living. You've know, you got to remember, for world, you know, and I, I realize there's a lot of bad shit happening in the world at any given time. I know that. But as far as worldwide peace, this is about the longest we've ever gone without major powers going to war, right? In the modern era. I mean, you're, you, you look at Europe in the 18th century, Mexico and France went to war over a pastry chef. I'm not kidding. There was a, 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 there was a, Mexico had a lot of government changes and a lot of riots and stuff after Spain moved out and they, they won their independence. And so there was a French pastry chef in, in Mexico City, had his, um, had his bakery destroyed by rioters asked the government for compensation. They said no. Ten years later, the French government randomly asked for compensation. They said no. France and Mexico went to war. France tried to install like a, a, a new like monarch there. It's bizarre. It's the 1830s and 40s. Crazy. They fought all the time. I always say. Um, so what we are used to living in the developed first world is uh, some of the longest peace anybody has ever seen ever. And so when you hear about... Um, what Julius Caesar did in Gaul, when you hear about the Holocaust, when you hear about the trenches in World War I, you name it. It's, so, it's, such a, um, it's such a dissonant view from what we are now. And you try to put yourself in the position of somebody because people weren't that different. They felt all the same things. Um, you try to put yourself in, in the shoes of a normal person who lived that and how that would change you. And I think that's what makes history so compelling is trying to relate to things that you really have a difficult time relating to. Um, and then on top of that, I think, yeah, there's a ton of great stories. I think, I think the reason we tell the tragic stories is because tragic stories always show us, I believe, that a, a good ending is achievable. And that doesn't mean that um, every tragic story ends well right away. Usually if it's a tragic story and it's, it's still tragic, it means it's not, it's not over yet. But we have seen time after time after time in history, so many good things come out of really bad, bad things. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll use this, and this is, a, this is a terrible example, but it's the one I can come up with. This is my last show, uh, like I, for me, my last show of, on Virgin Radio uh, for 2021. I'll be back, obviously, next year, so my brain's a little tired. But oh, Are you off next week? I'm off next week. Oh, that's yeah, sweet. Which is nice. So I'm still on the show here, but... Um, but uh, um, one of the things that um, I always find really interesting is the advancement in medical technology from 1914 to 1918. You know, we talk about, oh, well, there's tactics and there's guns and there's shooting and there's drama and high drama. I get that. But like the reason plastic surgery exists is because of the disfigurement that soldiers uh, from World War I came back with. And so they didn't want them to re-enter society. They would either have a mask or the first guy that got one had like the whole middle section of his face replaced and fixed by a doctor who came up with the strategy and then just performed the experimental surgery. It's the first time it's ever happened. It happened during World War I. You know, you, you see the development of penicillin, Canadian development, um, for, you know, to help with many things, mostly um, um, STDs. And, and so stuff like that, there is good that comes out of bad, and I think there are happy stories, as much as that seems a little bit dark. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are good stories and everything. We, we teach history negative event to negative event because usually negative events kick off something, and usually the happy story is at the end of the story. And then that was complete, and then, you know, and then there was world peace again. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think history is game tape. You yeah, know? yeah, it you is. You rarely look at game tape to be like, here's what you did great. Right. You look at it to go, here's how it could be better. But I also think history in school, the way, I don't know if it's the way it's used or meant to be used or the way it should be used. It, it's to teach emotional intelligence, which is something now that I really like history as an adult, I look back at like how I learned it 
in school and um, how I processed the information in school. And I was just like, I didn't have nearly as much emotional intelligence. Yeah. I was immature. You yeah. know, so it's, I think a lot of history hits me harder now when I learn it because so much of it is empathy. Yes. And you don't, nothing, if you talk about the Wright brothers and their plane, right, and, and learning how to fly, um, people talk about the event where they actually flew, but how many, it was like 25 planes before they figured it out, right? right. Um, if you don't have that failure, if you don't have that crisis, if you don't have that catastrophe, it's hard to feel good about the situation, right? That's just how human beings are. Does any movie that's worth its salt start off, hey, everything's great, and it's great all the way through the movie, and it ends great? No, it starts off where there's a big fucking problem, and we got to solve it. History is a story. History is a movie. History is a TV series. Everything that you want. The reason I love the, the conversations about Napoleon or World War I or whatever it is, or... Um, you know, the, the, the formation of automobile companies and the challenges, there was 500 at one point, 500 automobile companies registered in the United States, 500. And that was it. That was pre 1920. And you think about the, the, the companies that survived the Dodge brothers, Ford, it's like weed Chevro stores in Ontario. Yeah, now. yeah exactly. <laughs> Chevrolet, like all the ones that survived, survived because they fought and they fucking clawed their way to the top. And, and so that's an amazing, interesting story too, but it's always, history is always presented as a problem. And then how did humanity solve it or how did humanity move on from it? And some of those things are ongoing. I was, I was, it's a great question. Hmm. It is a great um, question. And I was trying to think of moments from history that are positive, that stand out in my mind and the way they're taught. And the one that stuck out in my mind and always plays like a movie, because I think that's how it actually went is um, the first time they ever used insulin. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They had a bunch of, or I think it was insulin, when they had a bunch of kids in iron lungs, they're probably going to die soon and everything. And the doctor just basically goes up a line of them mm -hmm. and starts injecting them and hopefully they get better. And one by one, they all start coming to life, basically. I listened to a history hit. This is one of the great, short podcasts in the world and history hits like the Netflix of, um, of history. So you can be like, it's like five bucks a month and you sign up and you get all these documentaries and stuff. But the guy who does it, it's out of England. The guy's name's Dan Snow and he's brilliant. And I've actually emailed him and been like, Hey, I'd just like to say, hi, I'm also a podcaster, blah, blah, blah. Never go back to me. But, uh, Oh, you're uh, one of those weirdos. Well, I just want to say, I thought he was doing a great <laughs> job and I was like, Hey, if you ever need a host for a history podcast, let me know. No, I'm um, kidding. I'm but, kidding. But what he did... Welcome to trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm a tough guy to get a hold of. Um, my, uh, one of the things they talked about uh, over the course of the pandemic was the history of vaccines. And, and pre-vaccine inoculation and how it was something that was done in Turkey and how it was considered exotic and they brought it over to the UK and in the, like the 1700s and how you know it was a woman that brought it over and it was because her husband, I think, had died or had been severely disfigured by smallpox. And they would have these inoculation parties where they would give you this small little bit of smallpox or something. And then you would, I, I'd have to go back and listen to it again, but like they would give you smallpox, but it'd be like a small amount, a trace amount. And so it wouldn't kill you, but it would, it would give you then immunity to it. Oh, like so it's, the vaccine. A hundred percent. But this is 250, 300 years ago. All right. And you're doing it. Like, imagine it's like, oh, we're going to a social gathering. It's like, I'm at, um, uh, what's that show that you always watch with uh, SL? Uh, the British show about aristocracy. Game of Thrones. Uh, Downton Abbey. Uh, Abbey. Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. Um, Downton Abbey, but like 150 years before that. Yeah. And they're all getting together at their tea and it's these big, beautiful rooms. It's like, okay, everybody's going to get smallpox today. How fucking crazy is that to think about, right? So they had a problem and then they, in this case, they imported the solution, but here's the solution. That's what's so great about history. It's, oh my God. Anyway, Dan Snow, check out History Hits. Great podcast. There, there was uh, there's a character that. Uh, never mind. It's a bad story. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's growth. <laughs> Jesse, go ahead. Woo! That's funny. Uh, this is from Argop. Hey guys, I'm currently writing my dissertation on how social media directly affects the NHL. Interesting. I have noticed how NHL players like Miko Rantanen, Jesper Kotkaniemi etc. 
haven't had the best before entering the, the NHL, but we're still top 10 draft picks. Haven't had the best, so I assume he means uh, social media. The more I dug into this, I noticed that these players use their personal skills on social media and their interviews to persuade teams into picking them higher than what their numbers suggest. Interesting. I have done hours and hours of writing and research on this topic, and this has happened way more than I thought. I wanted to ask if you believe social media campaigns and personalities affect the NHL draft, or is it all numbers and combine skills? No. What do you guys believe affects the draft the most? Also, I need to ask if I would be allowed to use some quotes from shows past in my research. Thanks, guys. Big fan. First of all, yes. Yes. But... Not a good idea. <laughs> we are not smart people. Uh, but 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 I think it's fair to say that I want to I want to know more. I'm sh- I want to know more too. I'm curious about this, but I'm not. Su- I wouldn't be surprised. Like, um, if you think that the NHL draft isn't obscenely political behind the scenes, and there isn't an enormous amount of lobbying from parents and agents and everything else, that's something we should ask Alan about. Yeah. What's the, oh yeah. Tell me about the the politicization behind the scenes. I don't know. Well, tell me what it's like. When you want a player to go five, ten draft choices ahead of where people think they should be, I'm sure there's. I'm sure that happens all the time. There's, uh, well, in the current generation of players getting drafted, have had social media since they were children, mm-hmm. which is new, and I mean children. Like Nick Suzuki, I think tweeted like he hates the Habs or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. He was a child. Like I don't, I think. But he I mean, was he was an right. elementary school student. The he was right though. Twenty and correct. Twenty thirteen uh, Boston collapse tweets. Yep. Like all the players who were kids back then have those tweets. They were watching kids. the Leafs. Yeah. Like how many? Like there are going to be players who tweeted something very shitty, and we are going to have to look at it and go, yeah, they were ten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were ten. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very interested in this. And it's something that I mean, parents and agents and the players themselves need to be much more conscious of. And it's definitely becoming more of a thing. We sort of we saw that with the was it Dusty Emu. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah, obviously, the, obviously the Leafs goaltending coach, we uh, just just for context. He was hired to be the Marley's guard goaltending coach. And he lasted a day. And he lasted a day because a bunch of really problematic shit was on his Twitter account. And for some reason, uh, Marley's management didn't check. From what I have heard, Leafs management, not thrilled. Yeah, and in <laughs> 2021, there's absolutely no excuse. There's there's no excuse for that. Yep. yep. Um, I remember all the way back in like 2009, I think it was, I interviewed a player. And he called me back or no, he didn't call me back. He corrected me in the moment after we were done the interview. And he goes, uh, not corrected me. He flagged something. He goes, uh, I want to answer that differently. And I go, okay. Mm-hmm. And he goes, and don't use the first one. I go, okay. So he answers it differently. And then he calls me like an hour later and he's like, I spoke to my parents and I'd like you to delete that answer entirely. Hmm. Interesting. And I was like, okay. And it was, it, it was over something innocent. I'll, I'll keep it private. But it was, it was over something relatively innocent. But he didn't want to... It could have been misconstrued that he was a partier. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Basically. And it would have 100% affected his draft stock. Yeah. Some scout would have listened or read that and would have uh, picked him a little, couple spots later. It's like yeah. in Moneyball. Oh, his girlfriend's ugly. Doesn't have any confidence. Yeah. Like, think of it, like it's that kind of shit. No, but that's yeah. the kind of shit, right? We're still not that far removed from that. Oh, it's it's a famous line from the movie. There is a player who I will, uh, uh, I I have to make fun of is uh, Calvin DeHaan. I got to talk to him in his draft year. Uh, just a great quote, great guy. And um, I said, "Do you know where you're ranked?" And he said, uh, "I think uh, somewhere like fifty second. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me laugh because yeah. who guesses fifty second? And I guess what he was fifty because he knew because he knew <laughs> he, he knew. was fifty. So this was obviously the midterm. He ended up going twelve. And in terms of like the social media aspect and players using that to get drafted, 
it's bigger in other sports, but the mixtape for your skills has has been around for a long yeah. time, especially in uh, basketball circles where you have a highlight reel of some high school kid performing his best in his high school game. And it happens a lot in football. And it definitely happens now in hockey where you go on YouTube and you look at highlights of this 16-year-old. And they're amazing. Dude, that was one of the – remember I sort of went through the desert and had to figure out what the hell I wanted to do with my career. Um, that was one of the ideas that me and a friend had. Doing mixtapes for kids? Yep. Awesome. Oh, that would have been fun. Yeah. Because I was like, all right, what do I know how to do? <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, what can I do with that? How can we... Well, I mean, we live in Toronto, so there's a lot of hockey players. We can... We know how to edit. We... We'll go to games. We'll you go record. to the some a couple uh, GTHL games. Find a find the top players on a couple teams. You'd probably have to go lower than that. Yeah, <laughs> like you'd yeah. probably have to probably leagues you've never heard of. And yeah, that was one of the ideas that I mm-hmm. I was going to do that for a career. I remember. Uh, I don't know if you guys. Glad if I you didn't. remember this, but I had buddies that were like in the skateboarders in high school. And we had a yeah. good we had a good little skateboard park right beside the school. Yeah, and so every every fucking day these guys would be talking about oh i gotta make my new my new tape I gotta make my yeah new tape. that's how you get discovered make my new tape get discovered it'd be like them doing a kickflip and it's like <laughs> standing still it's not like they were doing like a rolling kickflip flip it was just like <laughs> this is me doing a kickflip yeah i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna send this in and hopefully i got some stickers to put on my etnies <laughs> and, uh, alex borland why are was you, like that all oh, yeah? the time why are you knocking down their x games dreams <laughs> yeah Yo, you're right you're right you're right it's on <laughs> x games mode did one of them end up getting famous no oh no. Okay. <laughs> not a single one i thought it was someone no we never had a tony a, hawk yeah we yeah. went to school with yeah. tony hawk yeah <laughs> we're old it's, uh... yeah no none of them no no none of them <sighs> all right well Listen, we're going to be back next Monday, next Wednesday. Obviously, Friday is going to be our World Juniors preview show. I want to know. Um, huh? Yeah, let's. Uh, can we get a follow up from RG, our Go P on our, on our Discord channel about your dissertation? That would be great. Yeah. We can follow up and we can know. If you, I don't know if you could link to it and we can all read it. Like, that'd be yeah. fascinating. But yeah, can we, if we can get a follow up on that, please do. I love that idea. What a great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, listen, uh, we love you. And thank you so much for listening. And we will see you Monday. Till then. Do you have anything else you want to say? Steven? Yeah? Do you have anything else you want to say? Why no. are we so bad at these fucking extras? We're so bad. Like, you do it for a living. Too. I know. <laughs> I'm oh, eating no. all these right now. I'm eating all these turkey chips. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter. Steve underscore Dangle at Adam W-Y-L-D-E and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.